Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the ICE Podcast. My name is Austin Haney and today we are joined by a very special guest named Shannon Hayes, who is the CEO of Sapbush Hollow Farms in New York. Uh, she's the author of several books, including this one, which we're going to be talking about today, which is Redefining Rich. Um, she also has a PhD from Cornell. She runs a coffee shop. At one point, she was homeschooling her kids. This lady is doing it all. And has a cat, too. And she has a cat. Come on now. Um, so anyway, I am super excited about getting the chance to um, just learn from her, to learn how she is managing so many things and really building an integrated lifestyle. So Shannon, thank you for being on with us today. I am so delighted to be here and um, maybe my cat can star in this interview. Yeah, there we go. So tell us, um, obviously you have like a lot going on. Um, so kind of just overview what some of those things are and what kind of prompted you to write the book, like Redefining Rich that we're talking about today. Yeah, someone once described me as somebody who really likes to pack a lot into life. <laughs> I've heard that a lot in my life. Um, so I work with my family on Sapbush Hollow Farm, which is a diversified grass-based livestock farm in upstate New York in the Catskill Mountains. And in addition to that, I operate um, our family cafe, which is a farm-to-table cafe here in our hamlet, and I'm the chef here. And um, my husband and I have a number of other entrepreneurial ventures with full-time rentals, vacation rentals, and we have tenter sites, and we have a farm CSA. And in addition to that, um, I homeschool my kids and I work full-time as a writer. Full-time? I don't know. Does anyone ever work full-time as a writer? <laughs> I don't know. Um, but yeah, that's so that really is a lot. When I hear that, I'm like, whoo, each of those feels like it could be a full-time thing. Um, but I just wanted to say, first of all, like I read your book a few weeks ago and I was just in the bookstore and I kind of have this habit of like when I go to the bookstore, I'll pick up, you know, five or six books and read the introduction to see uh, which one's worth like reading the whole thing. And I picked up yours kind of like expecting a business book and maybe like just some practical tips for like managing your business. And what I honestly found was so much more than that. And really what resonated with me was the topic of like integrating your whole life. And so some people, um, it feels like the things they do in life kind of pulls them in different directions. And we always talk about balance and things like that. But you seem to be doing so many different things and yet it felt integrated and whole and stuff like that. So how did you find or like what was the importance of like integration in, in your life? Well, you know, a lot of times with business books, I feel like we are asked to separate ourselves, you know, to succeed in business. It, for some reason, the other part of us doesn't exist. And um, whether historically in farms, that has never, ever worked. Um, and as I came to be CEO of Sapbush Hollow Farm, and I had to learn more about being a business um, CEO and, and less about just a kid on the farm or just the next generation on the farm, I turned to a lot of business books myself and discovered that 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 wasn't taken into consideration. And as I tried to get better at managing the business and keeping things going, um, I have such a, a life vision and not just exclusively a career professional vision. You know, I have a vision for creating a world that um, my kids can stay in. You know, we have a history in our community of a brain drain of sending our children to other places. And I wanted to use my business to try to stop the flow, the outflow of this great talent that we have here. And to do that, I needed to really be invested in my family and help them uh, build a world here as well. So I felt that a lot of business books were not addressing that. And um, therefore, I wasn't getting the help I needed <laughs> to address that. And so I went on this quest to really understand if I wanted to grow my business and um, enjoy my life the way my husband and I dreamed about in our early years together, um, then I had to rethink things and had to learn from a lot of different disciplines, not just business. And so that's how that came to be. Yeah, that's really helpful. And so maybe before we get into like any business specifics of like what you're doing or how implementation strategies or anything like that, maybe it would be helpful to just learn a little bit more about you and what is kind of like um, those things that have kind of shaped you into who you are. And like, I guess, what is your um, vision for like 
this is the good life or this is like the type of life I want to build and like this is what you're working towards? I grew up as a girl of many contradictions and became a woman of many contradictions. Um, where I live here is where I grew up, and it's in the northern foothills of the Appalachian Mountain chain. So here, up here in these hills, the Appalachian Mountain culture was was still very much alive as I was growing up. And I was growing up in the farm crisis. So I always say that kids were being pushed off family farms as though they were weeds in the spray line of, of herbicides. And um, I the the life here though up in these hills was very subsistence based it wasn't industrial agriculture it was a lot of small farms small holdings where people were living off their land and and you know didn't have much else but didn't need much else and so that was the culture that i grew up in and um but that's not where i went to school because the school that I went to was a centralized school district, and it, I had a 40-minute bus ride, and that took us down into the valley. And in the valley, it was more of suburban fringe for the capital of New York State, Albany, New York. And that school was very uh, college and career focused. And so I had this dual existence. In one, I was supposed to get as much AP credit as I possibly could and go on to college and achieve as much as I possibly could in a profession. And in the other, I was learning about canning, about uh, finding wild blackberries and about uh, repairing barbed wire fences and picking up hay bales. So I had these two very, very disparate worlds. And um, I tried very hard to succeed and achieve in the academic-centered world that um, I was told I needed to, and uh, managed to have a PhD by the time I was 26 years old, and then realized that um, I was going to have to give up the other world um, if I followed what the academic path was teaching me. And um, that was breaking me apart. And not only was it breaking me apart, but what I went on and studied my PhD in, which was sustainable agriculture and community development, I developed an understanding of how this small scale farming lifestyle that I knew as a child growing up um, was integral to, to rebuilding our culture, to rebuilding our food systems, to rebuilding our sense of community. So I started, I finished my PhD and I didn't know quite what to do. If I went on and stud and became an academic, I was going to leave behind the world that I felt I was going to be teaching people to build. And that just became way too much contradiction for me to cope with. <laughs> so I decided that I needed instead to walk away from academia and walk away from the idea of having a conventional professional career and instead made my life my research and came back to the family farm and had to figure out how to make a viable business out of this life that I felt was truly the future of rural America. And so you write about that pretty extensively in your book. You talk about um, like many people, they feel like they have to choose, you know, whether it's um, for whether you're a farmer and you have to choose between like sustainability and um, I guess doing things that are good for the planet and making a profit. Or you also told a story in the book of, um, you know, as a Cornell student, um, you you looked at around at the female professors that you were kind of like looking up to and um, you put a few boxes next to their names and you were like, how many of them are married, still married, like they have kids and they have tenure. And you realize that like none of them could check all the boxes. And so it became really clear to you that, um, you know, it almost seemed like the economy or the way things were set up was you've got to choose between like having a family life and, and that world, that's super important, or to have like an academic and a career life. And so it seems like um, there was a few moments like that that kind of began this journey of something's broken and I need to find a, a new way. So um, what do you feel like, yeah, was that new way or what kind of like led you to make that switch? Um, well, the first thing that happened is I decided it was pointless being angry about it. Um, I did see very clearly that yes, it was broken. And I started to recognize, I started, uh, I'm, a, I'm a, a 
a chronic pencil pusher. I'm always like adding up numbers and running calculations. It's just this compulsion that I have. And not only was I observing that it was culturally broken for me as a woman to have all the things that I wanted, but economically it was broken too. Um, my husband and I both had advanced degrees and if we both went to work, I realized that we could not, when I balanced out uh, two full-time salaries and took away for taxes and professional wardrobes and buying rather than growing our own food and having to drive to jobs and live in a place with a higher cost of living, I realized that those two professional salaries were not going to cut it. And so rather than being um, angry, which I think a lot of us tend to do to say, wow, the system's broken and I'm angry. I saw it as this great life challenge that maybe it was time for something different. Maybe it was time to reject the convention. And um, my husband and I just imagined that we could build a world where we could be together as a family. We could be with our children every single day and we could have, you know, the abundance and joys that we craved and we didn't have to accept this either or kind of life. And that maybe it was our calling, our great calling to figure out how it can be done and to not accept that the world is, that the game is rigged, that it's all stacked against us. It was time to build something different and to build possibility so that other people could say, yeah, I'm not accepting that either. I'm going to build something different and to build something that our kids could then say, yeah, we don't have to make that choice either. Yeah, I love that. That when you were talking, it really reminded me, I feel like at the heart of entrepreneurship is really that like innovative spirit of not just accepting how things are, but seeing, okay, if if there's these two realities, I'm, I'm not going to choose A or B, like I'm going to make C and make it kind of make it happen. Um, so I think that's really awesome and inspiring. Um, and I want to kind of bridge from that into a topic that I think you talk about a lot in the book and I think is like worthy of talking about a lot. Um, and it's kind of the idea of true wealth. And um, so you talk about true wealth as opposed to just like monetary, like and just financial wealth. So um, for the help of like the podcast, could you give us kind of like a working definition of what true wealth is to you and why it's important? Well, it's it's very easy as farmers to key in on true wealth because um, farming is one of the worst paid vocations out there. And you got to say, well, why do farmers do it? <laughs> and uh, so um, my understanding of true wealth comes from from that perspective. Um a lot of times we are trained to look at businesses, to look at our careers in terms of how much we earn. And so wealth is what do you get in that paycheck? How much is left in the bank at the end of the week, at the end of the month, at the end of the year? How much can you build up over a lifetime? And then what can you buy with it? You know, how nice is your house? How nice is your car? How nice are your vacations? That's sort of the conventional understanding of true wealth. I mean, that, rather not true wealth. That's the conventional understanding of wealth. But that is not how it works for us. Um, it can look, our income can actually look very, very small. The number of years that um, I've had more than $20,000 for a family income, combined income for Bab and me, I can count on, on one hand. And yet we are extremely wealthy because we have the things that we really want, which is fresh air, clean water, access to the outdoors, to play, to run barefoot. It's about having um, nights where you can sit and play music together with your friends and your family. It's about a really good meal around the table. It's about feeling safe and having people in your life that you are connected with. These are the foundations of true wealth. And that can sound like a lot of poetry. Um, and, but I'll tell you that on this journey, it's very easy to fall off and get resentful when you're worried about how you're going to get bills paid and, you know, you have all these real life circumstances. And um, I certainly dealt with that, especially when I came to the helm of the business and I realized that my insurance guy gets paid, the feed bill gets paid, the veterinarian bill gets paid, all the, the mortgages and all that, they all get paid. But I started to realize I was the only one who didn't seem to get paid. And um, this was early on, and I was very resentful. And I had to go through 
a transformation where I went away. I, my husband and I uh, shut down the cafe and left a text note and a note to the door saying, hey, we gone fishing. <laughs> and we, we disappeared with our kids for 48 hours. And we spent those 48 hours going to every swimming hole within a five mile radius. And in that journey, I realized that I was wealthy that I tended to see myself as this guardian, this guardian of the land, of this legacy that my family has passed on, the guardian of the fields and the pastures and the foodscapes. And on that 48-hour journey, I realized I am not just the guardian. I am the beneficiary. I get to play in the water. I get to nuzzle the dogs and the livestock. I get to eat well. And I started to transform, and I could have given lip service to the idea of true wealth easily. But at that time, I started to transform and realize, wow, every day when the bills aren't paid, I still have these things. And then I also realized another component of true wealth, which was the problem I mentioned at the top of this interview that I was studying sustainable agriculture and community development, and I decided to make my life's work, my research, you know, I'm, I'm integrated. And my question was always about how does the family farm survive and thrive and help to rebuild the culture in rural America? And I studied that for my PhD because it's a fascinating question. And I started to recognize that true wealth isn't just about the soil and the water and the sunlight and the human connections and the good food. It's about the fascinating problems that we have. It's about getting to grapple every day with a problem that you care about. It's, you know, I don't have to get up and figure about, you know, how to deal with widgets that I think are pointless and useless and just pollution on the planet. I get up every day and I have problems that matter. They're fascinating. And Bob and I go out for a walk every morning and we drink our coffee in the woods and we talk about the problems. And we've started to identify that those problems are actually part of our true wealth. They are honorable, important issues that are fun to work on. They're puzzles that we get. And that too is part of our true wealth bank account. And what happens... Um, after that, once you recognize that and you start to believe it from the depths of your soul, <laughs> I don't know why, but all of a sudden the abundance just gets bigger. <laughs> you know, once I stopped being angry and resentful and left that victim mentality behind and recognized that when I have a problem about how to keep the checkbook up to date and keep the cash flowing, that's a, that's a puzzle and I can enjoy that. And when um, I realize no matter what happens, when I'm sitting in front of my spreadsheets, I still have my family and good food and great friends and the ability to go outside and breathe fresh air and drink clean water and put my toes in the creek. Well, then you just can't help but enjoy it. And when you're approaching your problems from a position of excitement and joy and engagement, somehow they get a lot easier to solve because it all just adds to the fun. And from that, the business has just grown and done very well. Yeah. I think this was one of the things that I resonated most throughout the book and seems to be like a central theme throughout the whole thing is, is, um, wow, there's so many things I want to talk about within this, but, um, one was just like kind of the posture of gratitude and abundance of, um, rather than having like the scarcity mindset and, and things, but to really see the the good in life all around you, to see like the true wealth opportunities. Um, and I also loved how you talked about um, even the harder things or the struggles that you face, um, recognizing like, hey, we chose these struggles. Like these are the ones, these are the issues, these are the tough things that we wanna face. Um, I think that actually brings a lot of like fulfillment in, in life is when you're doing things that like, even though this is really hard, we want to be tackling these problems because we believe it and stuff like that. And um, you made a comment like later in the book, I'll just quote you on for a second. Um, but it, you, you said that without the hard things in life, my life would be boring. But without the quality of life that I have, I don't know if I could endure the hard things. And I love that like, you know, those two things seem to go hand in hand together of, yes, it's not all utopia. There are some really hard things, but um, recognizing the good all around me helps me get through it. 
And so um, you you gave us a chart in your book that I felt like was super helpful. Um, and I wanted you to just kind of flesh it out even more um, today. But it's basically two cycles. Um, and they both started with the idea of true wealth. And I thought that was very interesting because it's not like um, I, what, what you helped me understand was it's not like some people want things like community and family and a life and to do things they care about. And then some people just want money. It's like, no, actually, we all like desire these like true wealth things, even if we might define them slightly differently. But somewhere like we get lost along the way. A lot of us get lost along the way. And so you talk about um, one cycle that's kind of like where we go wrong and then one cycle of how we can, I guess, get it back on track or do it right. So could you kind of explain those and um, even how you came up with those? Sure. Um, <clears throat> that's, uh, I think what you're referring to is extractive economics um, versus uh, true wealth. Um, and one is a linear model. Um, so it's, it's actually extractive economics versus life serving economics and um, extractive economics is a linear model. It's, it's, it's classic economics 101. You start with abundance. You start with true wealth. You start with the, the foundation of everything, <clears throat> which is soil, water, sunlight. And from that, everything grows. <laughs> and but what happens when you have all these things? Because if you, you know, go back in time, what did we start with? Well, you had soil, you had water, you had sunlight. Um, economics, classic extractive economics begins when you decide to have a perception of scarcity. And then you can commodify it. If you say, well, <laughs> there's only so much of anything. There's only so much food. There's only so much ability to grow food. There's only so much ability to get the right tools to grow the food. Um, you start extracting and you start trying to pull things out and have commerce around it. And um, you have uh, competition for land. You have competition for resources. And then from that competition, from that extraction, you get money in the end. And it's very linear, and the only thing that you can guarantee is money. Maybe you can use that money to pay for your kids to have a college education, or you can use that money to pay for a nice vacation, to have some nice things. But in the end, it it just it pulls things down from from out of the earth and and converts it to money. Life serving economics is a different model, and I like to think of it as more of a circle. Once again, you start off with the foundations of true wealth, soil, water, sunlight, but the perception is very different. The perception is abundance. There is enough. We can make sure there is enough. And from there, you go to cultivation. So you choose methods of production that cultivate that are in honor with the earth. You're not trying to extract from the earth. You're trying to get what you need while reinvesting in the earth. And then that does lead to the next phase in the circle, which is reinvestment. So in the cultivation phase, you know, uh, you, you can see someone like me who's growing food. That's just classic cultivation, obviously. Or um, I'm trying to, uh, you know, someone might have a cafe or another small business that um, helps not only create something that is needed for the community, but also is then putting money back into the community. And then you get to the reinvestment stage. <clears throat> and that's very important because what I started to see was that absolutely everybody is in a position to reinvest in a life-serving economic model. So reinvestment for me might be, well, <clears throat> one of the things that I did recently, pure economic reinvestment, is I had a little inheritance from my grandmother when she died. And our local food co-op wanted to do an expansion and they needed a loan. So I took my money and I invested it in the food co-op so that they could grow their business. Well, recently they paid the loan back and I took the money. There was um, a house uh, right near our farm and I invested it in fixing up that house so that somebody else could live there. Um, so it was like a reinvestment of just economics, but there's other ways of reinvestment. For example, 
Um, my kids are now getting pretty independent and my husband and I are realizing <laughs> we have a lot of energy and we have a lot of love and passion for our lives. And um, a number of, you know, I have uh, nieces and nephews whose parents are working a very different lifestyle. And we are able to, Bob and I, be here to invest in those children. We're able to take them and let them stay in our home. And we're able to take them out and help them get on the land. Um, we were able to take a young man who was displaced by COVID and help him get his education and, and get his start in life. So reinvestment doesn't have to be a financial investment. In this case, it was an investment of love, of home-cooked food, of time and attention. So um, reinvestment comes in many different forms. And then from that, well, you have more hearts, you have more hands, you have the ability to then generate more true wealth. Maybe, you know, by investing in the co-op, the co-op is now able to do more business. More people are able to have more jobs tied to the co-op. More farmers are able to sell more food because the co-op is there. You've created more true wealth in your cycle, just as investing time into these young people who are then becoming young people in our community who are learning to honor the soil and the water and the sunlight and take care of them. So that, again, becomes more true wealth. So this whole cycle just keeps growing and creating more abundance. That's why I think it's a, a much more realistic model for creating a better world. Yeah, I, I really agree. And what I think is cool is it seems like in your context, it revolves heavily on like the farming aspect and very like... Um, you know, you talk about sunlight and soil and things like that. And living in a city, sometimes I think we don't always think about our true wealth in exactly the same terms. But I think that the idea for me, as I was listening to you, the idea of stewardship, of just like recognizing, like, what are the resources and things that are sources, of those true wealth, like um, whether it's my community, um, whether it's even like um, my church or something like that, or um, just the people that I have in life around me, like, what are those sources? And then how can I like steward those really well. And one way I've seen this like played out, I think is, um, um, I've told you a little bit about this, but I've gotten a few opportunities to like go overseas and, um, to do work with nonprofits and things overseas. And, um, I remember there was an occasion when I was in, um, Uganda and the people there were definitely like poor and living more of like a nomadic, um, agricultural lifestyle. And at first, when I went over there, my Western brain was like, oh my goodness, like these people need so many resources. They need water, electricity, like schools, education, churches, like all, like just the whole thing. And it was overwhelming because it's like, where do you even begin? Um, and I thought of poverty very much in terms of like, um, you know, monetary terms. But what, I, you know, as I was even reading your book, I started thinking about that maybe a better way of like approaching like helping some of these communities is beginning with what is the true wealth in their community? Like what is some of the things that they already have access to? Um, and even like learning from them, taking a learning mentality of um, what what is like good in this community and how can we get them to cultivate that, reinvest that um, rather than just bring in like, I don't know, an American tractor or something to, to help them out. So that really, that really resonated with me. And um, there's also a book, I don't know if you've heard of this book, but um, it's a book called Garden City, and I really love the book, but it kind of talks about how we started, uh, you know, and from a biblical point of view, like we started in a garden, and it talks about how the work and the things that we do can move us towards like a garden city, and basically it's very similar of learning to like cultivate the things um, in life rather than like uh, just using them, doing them poorly or whatever, but like learning to really cultivate them. And I think that all goes back to what you're talking about is good stewardship and, um, and yeah, and, and like having that abundance mentality. Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting. You talk about you know, finding that true wealth in these different environments. And I think you're right. You do have to hone in and identify where that true wealth is. And that's the start of how you make change because the, the classic Western develop, development model has been to go in and bring about the change that we value. Like, here's how to monetize this. And um, when I was in grad school, mm -hmm. we would see this and it just used to, you know, drive me nuts that, oh, great, we're going to take people who are, you know, able to grow food for themselves and get them some cash. And so we're going to have them grow cash crops for export, for example, and then deplete their true wealth, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, their ability mm -hmm. to take care of themselves and yeah. their self, their self-reliance. So it, yeah, it's a, it's a definite, um, 
important consideration to say, wait a minute, wait a minute, where are things, where is that wealth, that community connection, those meaningful relationships? Because if, if those are lost, the money's worthless. So you have to start with honoring where those things are. Yeah, that's good. So I want to talk a little bit, kind of, kind of getting near the end, um, but a little bit about implementation strategies and maybe even some things for someone that's listening to this and either has the hesitation of, well, that sounds utopian and I don't know how to get there, you know, or you don't, you don't know what my job and my life and what it's like. I'm already managing so much. I can't do this. Or, or also the gap of someone that just says, um, you know, I like the idea of pursuing true wealth and having an integrated life, but I don't really want to live on a farm. Um, what, how do you feel like, um, that, especially that, that idea, I think, the idea of having an integrated life, how do you think that can begin to be implemented across the board, no matter where you are today? It starts with the quality of life statement. And um, I talk about it in the book. Uh, a quality of life statement is something that you and the sentient members of your household are able to all agree on, um, where you you come together and you say, this is, this is the life that we vision. You know, and it, you know, think about what do you want your days to feel like? What time do you want to be waking up in the morning? How do you want meal times to feel? How do you want, you know, what kinds of creative pursuits do you want? And you, you create this vision that takes everybody's needs and ideas into consideration. And I call that just simply the quality of life statement. And from there in the book, I explain it a little bit more in depth. Um, I've actually learned that there are a couple different income streams that you need to go for. So the conventional job and just getting a job <clears throat> a lot of times isn't going to help you meet that quality of life statement, particularly if you're listening to this podcast and you have an interest in entrepreneurship. Um, so what I learned in the course of my business work is to cultivate a couple different income streams, but all of them must be consistent with that quality of life statement. So you can have conventional employment, um, but it has to honor your quality of life. It has to be something that sings to your soul. It's not just a J-O-B job that you do and walk away from and hate it. It has to actually enrich your soul and be meaningful. So it's meaningful employment. The second form of income um, that you should be considering is self-employment or business income. And I show in the book how um, that business income can actually help reduce your tax liabilities even if the business is losing money. So even if your business isn't always in the black, business income can actually really be an important part of your overall economic profile. The third type of income um, is actually my single largest source of income in our household, which is non-monetary income. There are a lot of ways that uh, people can um, reduce their expenses through non-monetary income. Classic on my in my situation, of course, is that I'm on a farm, so I don't have to pay for my food. You know, I'm already growing that as part of my livelihood. But um, another way that I have non-monetary income, um, I have a, a daughter who is visually impaired and extremely learning disabled as a result of visual impairment. And um, her, uh, to get her to the schools and to the therapists that she needed would have been, um, uh, the school that we could have gone to was about $40,000 a year at the time. And we would have had to close up and relocate. So my family uh, got behind me in getting me uh, the help to be her home therapist and to provide those resources at home. So that's a huge non-monetary income that the whole family gathered around and said, okay, let's support Shannon so Shannon and the kids can stay home and, and do this so that we don't have to come up with that money to send Ula to a special school. So non-monetary income is very important. And then the fourth form of income is passive income. And that can be any number of things. You just uh, helped with my passive income by reading a book. <laughs> uh, you bought a book and I get royalties from that. So it could be something like that. It, passive income could be um, lending, um, you know, making loans to other local businesses. We've done that before. It can be um, fixing up a room in your house and putting it on Airbnb. There are lots of forms of passive income. So I just outlined four different income streams conventional but meaningful employment, self-employment or business income, non-monetary income, and passive income. And what I recommend people do is choose three. Choose three. 
and make sure they are in alignment with that quality of life statement. And that may not be something you can do today, but you can start planning for that today. And you can get that quality of life statement done today. And when you start understanding with that quality of life statement and then working on those different income streams, then you start to diversify where your your well-being, where your economic well-being is coming from, and you get a lot more stable. And you actually end up being able to require a whole lot less money, which can enable people to leave jobs that are making them unhappy. I mean, we are still in the great resignation (laughs) and people um, are still looking to get out of jobs that they don't like. This is a way to do that and to build something that's meaningful, that helps to revitalize and rebuild this world in the image that maybe a lot of more of us can be happy in. I do um, have on my website at uh, satbush.com, if people go over to the blog, there is a workbook, a Redefining Rich workbook, which does take people through some of these exercises, if that is of help to anybody. And it's free. They can just download it. Well, I'm definitely going to encourage people to um, check out the book and check out the workbook. I'll leave a link to that. Um, and I think that it's, it's really neat in the book how you talk sometimes at more of a high level um, and kind of like an overview. And then you get into the nitty gritty and you'll talk about economics and how you can like diversify your income streams and build security through different means of making wealth. And so honestly, as like someone that's running their own business, I thought the book was like incredibly creative and, um, and had a lot of overlap, even though I'm not a farmer, I'm actually like filming weddings. Uh, there was things that I was like, Oh, I can implement this. This is, this is like really good idea. Um, and so I want to ask you maybe our final question of today, but, uh, for the person that is listening to this and thinks, wow, you just gave me like, I need to go and start a side hustle and a passive income stream. And like, I, oh my goodness, like now I have so much to do. Um, you, you gave a story in the book of a, um, how the quality of life statement can help you know what to pursue, but also what to like say no to and what is not, not a good time to pursue. And um, the specific story, I can let you explain it um, in more detail than I can, but it was about a lady who wanted to like, um, start sewing and she started out just like with an idea of she wants to start sewing or knitting or something like that Uh, but then before long like sewing had taken over her life and it was becoming way too much and so can you kind of um, reshare that story and just talk about um, yeah for the person that says I don't know if I should start 27 things right now um, how do how can a quality of life statement help them know what to say yes to and what to say no to so the quality of life statement um, and in that particular story um, the, 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 the fictitious family said, look, we love that we can get our house clean in under two hours on the weekend. So we're not spending all our time. We like having a small house. We want to spend our weekends out in the state park nearby going for hikes. Um, and they just wanted this nice, simple life, but they wanted more, uh, economic independence. So, um, somebody in the family started sewing and then what happened is people were like, oh, wow, you know, you're, you're repurposing clothes, you're refitting, retrofitting. And they started handing off fabric, bags of fabric. <laughs> and this, this poor person, you know, people would like leave bags of fabric on their doorstep. And the kids, teachers at school was sending home fabric from the other kids. And somebody was cleaning out, you know, a family member who passed away, they're cleaning out their apartment and dumped tons of fabric. And um, then people were asking this person to do sewing and stuff. But their nice clean house all of a sudden had a living room filled with garbage bags <laughs> filled with fabric in this story. And so they started thinking about, well, you know, if this business is really going to take off, maybe we should look at that house that just came up for sale down the street. It's a little bit bigger. It has an extra room in it. We could have a sewing space and we could store all this stuff. And so this family was on the cusp of making a very big financial investment. And that's where I called in the quality of life statement and said, okay, wait, stop. You said you wanted to be able to clean your house in under two hours and you wanted to spend your time hiking. And sewing is great. It's a wonderful thing to be doing. But how about using the word no instead? And this family, this fictitious family had to learn to say, no, we don't want your hand-me-downs. Take them to Goodwill. Take them to the local thrift store. And then when we need a particular item, we will go to the thrift store. We will give the thrift store money for taking care of these items. 
so that the thrift store is in business and we'll just buy only those things that we need. And so that way the family was actually able to, yes, they're paying a little bit more. They're not getting free fabric scraps <laughs> to do their projects, but, and they were giving that money to the thrift store, but they weren't taking on a whole new uh, house that was not what they were going to be happy with because the house was going to require more care, more upkeep and more money. Uh, so that is how the quality of life statement can really help you make much better decisions. The other thing that you mentioned, Austin, that I think is important to hone in on is people are starting this journey. They're listening to this podcast and just what you said, oh my gosh, she's giving me so many things I'm going to have to do. And I have noticed in my own journey that it's always, it's always um, our habit to look at the person who has done something with a little bit of resentment and say, well, they have this and I don't. And now I have to go do this. And I, I want people to remember, I've been in this for 40 plus years. And I also had a point where I was trying to get out of a job and my husband was, you know, getting fired from a job <laughs> and, uh, and we didn't know how we were going to make it either. And the best memories were the journey. And so even though you may not have a great full-time business, maybe you don't have all your income streams where you want them to be, maybe your quality of life statement isn't written yet, that just means the best is, is coming. The most fun is coming because it's not having done it that's as great as getting to do it. It is the, the journey of dealing with the problems, dealing with the struggles and having this fun. Because remember what I said, those problems are part of your wealth. And it's the adventure of trying and moving toward it that is really what the life is about. It's about experiencing it. So don't worry if you're not there. Start. Enjoy that adventure. Right on. That's a, that's such a good word. And um, I think that has been so true with as I've talked to different people, whether in the creative space, entrepreneurial space, uh, it really is all about like enjoying the process, because if you don't enjoy the process, you're going to quit. Um, and so learning to like really enjoy that, to see the hard things and take them, take them on the chin and to keep going and to learn from them. Um, I think that's really great. And I really enjoyed the way that you wrote the book, um, just kind of hyping you up because the way that you wrote the book was full of like practical things, but it wasn't just like a, um, you know, here's seven things to do to improve your business. It was full of stories and personal experiences and things that you've been through. Um, and so now, like when I think about, um, even as someone that has turned like a hobby from photography and things into a business, I've seen the accumulation of, um, you know, camera gear and all that in my own life. And I, I was relating to, you know, the fictitious family that was um, building up all of their, uh, all their sewing equipment and stuff. And now I feel like whenever I, continue to go down that path, I, I have like a really easy story to remember like, oh, okay, remember that girl and learn from her wisdom. And so I just want to thank you for for writing the book and thank you for being on the podcast. Um, for anyone listening, I'm definitely going to give some links to go and check out more of Shanna's work and her book and things like that, um, because I think it'll be encouraging to you. And Shanna, I just want to say thanks again. And um, it was great to have you on today. Thank you for having me, Austin. I had a good time. <laughs>